my hands, my feet, I'm talking about what he's done for me. I get joy just thinking about what he's done for me. I get joy, joy thinking about what he's done for me. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome again to our Wednesday Bible study. We certainly appreciate you joining us. We pray these lessons have been beneficial in helping you as you grow in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Now, growing in and through worship is essential to reaching spiritual maturity. Remember, our goal is not only to grow but become mature. You know, children will grow, but not all of them will exhibit maturity. Now, the first thing that we must have is the right understanding of what worship is. Next, we'll examine why we worship, whom we worship, and finally, how we worship. Now, I can see many of you imagining that you have that part down pat. You go to church every week, you sing, you pray, you give, commune, and get a word from the Lord. You go away feeling satisfied that you've checked all the right boxes and that God is pleased until next week. Sadly, our culture has fostered a watered-down concept of worship in the minds of God's people. Dr. Harris says in his book, the Path to Spiritual Growth and Maturity, Solutions to Growing a Deeper Faith. Get this book. It will bless your life. He says, worship is where we as Christians choose to honor and reverence God for the general goodness of who he is. Every Christian should spend time daily in awe of God for the greatness of his character because of his unfailing love for us. We worship God because of who he is. Look at Matthew chapter 14, verses 31 through 33. This is when Peter was asking Jesus to let him come down and walk on the water. You know the story quite well. Peter came down, he walked for a while, but then he began to notice the winds and the waves and he began to sink and he said, Lord, save me. And the Lord saved him. Verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying of a truth, Thou art the Son of God. They didn't worship him because he walked on the water and because he let Peter walk on the water, they worshiped him because they realized that he was in fact the son of God. They worshiped him because now they knew who he was. Look at Matthew chapter eight, verse number two. And behold, there came a leper and worshiped him saying, Lord, if thou wills, thou canst make me clean. How did he know Jesus could make him clean? Because he knew who he was. He worshiped him. And the word translated as worshiped is the Greek word proskinio, to, which means to do reverence to. It's also translated as to bow down or to bow down before or prostrate himself before. It carries the meaning of humbling yourself before God and his son, Jesus. Note the greater is always worshiped by the lesser, never the other way around. I wonder how many times have you come into the fellowship with an humble spirit before God? The more we grow in the knowledge of him and the more we come to realize how great he is and that he alone is worthy of our worship. He is the creator of all things and all things were made for him. He is eternal and was here before the beginning. The psalmist declared that he is from everlasting to everlasting. He's gracious because he gifts us 
what we need without our asking. He saved us by giving his son as a gift that we didn't even know that we needed. He loves us for reasons only he could understand. He is our father and he is all that we know as a father. He provides for us, watches us, guides us, feeds us, protects us, and has allowed us into his family. He's holy. And to be holy is to be set apart for the service of God. Wherever God is, is holy ground because he is holy. Now with this understanding of who God is and who Christ is, we should worship him daily. It reminds us that we belong to a loving God that cares for our every situation. It reminds us that we honor and adore him. When others see our worship and perceive our allegiance to God and his Christ, it honors God. Listen to Jesus in John chapter 4, verse 23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is looking for us to worship him. And he's looking for us to worship him in adoration and admiration. We don't worship to check a box or to mark that off our to-do list. As we grow towards spiritual maturity, our worship will become pleasing to God because it comes from a true reverence toward him because of who he is. It has been said that if you do not do what we call the five acts of worship, that you have not worshiped. I've heard it. I've even taught it. But I've never found it that way in scripture. Worship is more than acts, but an attitude. Singing can be accomplished with no real thought of who God is. There are times where you're caught up with the words and the melody and the tempo and the harmony, and it can easily divert our attention from the object of our song to the song itself. Giving can be accomplished from a sense of duty versus a sense of gratitude. How many of you give just because the Bible teaches you to give? But we really ought to be giving because God first gave to us and showing our gratitude, we give back to him. Now, if we give like that, how do you think that God looks at our worship? Do you think that's what God wants us doing a duty? Or does he really want us to genuinely be grateful for his gifts? Listen to what Jesus says in Mark chapter 7. Verse number six, he answered and said unto them, well hath he says prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. We can do the acts of worship and our heart be far from God. The spiritually mature will worship God with the proper attitude from the heart and not focus only on on the acts. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desirest not, delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. The psalmist seems to indicate it's not the sacrifice that God's want. It's the humility that God is looking for. It's the gratitude. It's the honor from the worshiper that God is seeking. What we really ought to do is practice worshiping God daily. Now we've talked before about the benefits of quiet time. It is here that we can begin our daily worship of God. Worship is different than praise. We praise him 
because of what he does, but we worship him because of who he is. Think about it. If I don't get the job I'm after, he's still God. If I don't get out of trouble, he's still God and worthy of our worship. We worship him because of who he is. You know, we praise athletes and entertainers and even our children for the things that they do, but we don't worship them. Worship and praise is two different things. We praise God for what he does, but we worship him because of who he is. Spiritual maturity places a greater importance on our worship. Again, Dr. Harris from his book is quoted as saying, spiritual maturity is consistently doing the right things over time, so it becomes second nature. Worship displays growth and then maturity because we honor God in the fashion that he deserves. Maturity enters the equation because we begin to realize that worship is not about us, it is about God. Maturity is knowing this and bringing our best on Sunday for the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse number 7. Uh, Dr. Harris says that that's where we exhibit our maturity because now we know what worship is all about. Now, I've mentioned before that growth is subtle. And it's not always recognized. However, one clear sign of spiritual growth is our ability to forgive. To forgive is quite possibly, if not, the hardest thing a Christian has to do. All of us are challenged in this area of spiritual growth. And I am still trying to reach the level I believe the Lord wants. Listen at Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, <clears throat> neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's, that's a sobering in-your-face thought. Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, God's not going to forgive you. And I'm wondering, I've thought often about, is there something that I don't want God to forgive? And the answer is absolutely not. So in that case, if I want God to forgive everything, I've got to learn how to forgive everything. Forgiveness is a foundational principle in Christianity and is often misunderstood and is therefore not practiced as often or as well as is needed. The Bible's full of examples of forgiveness and sadly too many of us fail to take heed. This is a clear sign that you are growing spiritually when you learn how to forgive. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, Verse number 21 through 35, Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, 
Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desiredst me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Anybody see themselves in this in this situation? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Jesus makes it very clear, and he leaves no room for a loophole. There's no doubt in what he's saying. You want forgiveness? You must give forgiveness. He reminds us that we need forgiveness as much as we need daily bread. Why? Probably because we sin daily. He also shows us that it will come in the measure that we meet. If I don't forgive others, then God is not going to forgive me. In case they didn't understand, he amplifies the thought in verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. It has been said that carrying a grudge is like carrying around a hot coal waiting to throw it at someone. Failing to forgive hurts us more than it hurts the other person. We are the ones that are rehearsing the incident. We are the ones eaten up with anger. We are the ones who won't let it go. We are the ones who open the door for Satan's entrance into our attitudes and actions. The more you remember what was said or what was done, the more you tell yourself, what you should have said or what you should have done. That's not what God wants floating around in the hearts of his children. We show our spiritual growth as we learn how to forgive. Again, Matthew 6, 14 and 15, Jesus said, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. You know, there's no provision for Christians to get people told or put them in their place or let them know who they're messing with or, or paying them back. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Paul writes in Romans 12, 14, Bless them that persecute you. Bless and curse not. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Satan will move in to exploit our weakness in this area. We'll be upset that the person seems to be getting away with what they did. Our minds will continually go over what was said and what was done and not allow the wound to heal. Anybody know you keep picking at a scab, it's never going to heal. He'll plant seeds of what I should have done or what I'll do next time. 
Again, notice Paul's closing advice to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Forgiving also brings us glory. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11, the New International Version reads, A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. Great quote from a great man, Mahatma Gandhi says, The weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. And I pray that you are growing spiritually, that you are becoming mature Christians in the body of Christ, and that you're learning how to forgive one another. Once more, we thank you. We thank you so much for blessing us to be a part of being, of being a part of this lesson. Please share these lessons with others. Subscribe to our channels. Like us on Facebook. We hope that you will help us to spread this ministry. Let folk know there is a word from the Lord. Until next time, as always, we pray you'll be careful and be prayerful. God bless you. It's in my hands, my feet, I'm talking about what he's done for me. I get joy just thinking about what he's done for me. I get joy, joy thinking about what he's done for me.